Our show today pays homage to a floral display in one of the most scenic parts of South Africa. Join us for an exclusive tour of the sights and sounds of Namakuland during flower season. The Namakwa region of the Northern Cape is a vast, arid, unspoilt expanse of mystery and beauty that covers over 440,000 square kilometers along the west coast of South Africa. This is the traditional home of the Nama people, one of the main groupings of the Khoi who still populate the region. Uh, when the Dutch came uh, in 1652, in fact before them the Portuguese already came to the coast of, of South Africa and they came into contact with the Khoi people. The Dutch called them Hottentot. Uh, they also came into contact with, with the Sand people and the Dutch called them Boschismanen. And Boschismanen means people from the bush, people living in the bush. And when the English came, they called them Bushmen, and in Afrikaans it became Busman. But uh, the Khoi people called them San, and San means people without livestock. And if you look at the Khoi people, or uh, uh, as the Dutch called them, Hotantot, um, there were a lot of groups. In fact, when, when uh, Van Riebe came, he came into contact with the Horn Haikwa, the Hora Kaukwa, the Horn Haikona, and in this part of the country, the Nama. Originally, they were called uh, Namakwa, the Namakwa people. And that's why the district, uh, the district municipality is called Namakwa, district, district municipality. So all these people uh, were here when, uh, when the Dutch came. And they, they didn't disappear. Today, they are called Kalat. Namakwaland is dotted with romantic sounding towns like Garis, Lekersing, and Nababip, which flies in the face of the seemingly harsh landscape and arid conditions. The familiarity of these names reminds us of the influence the Khoi have had on our historical and cultural landscape. The Namakwaland economy was built on mining. Yeah, a long, long ago, centuries before the Dutch settled down at the Cape, the Nama people already made use of copper. And they made their own uh, articles like rings, earrings, um, necklaces, etc. So when the Dutch came, they came into contact with the Nama people and they realized that these guys know, know where, the, where the copper is. So the Dutch decided they will send out some expeditions to try and find the place of the copper. They found the place, but then Simon van der Stel realized there are some big challenges. They decided um, finally not to open a mine here. Around about 200 years went by and the story of copper uh, gathered dust. And then uh, uh, the uh, Cape Company, Phillips and King, decided, no, they would like to open a mine here. And they came to Springbok in 1852. They bought some land from uh, local people, the Kluter family, uh, which the, the name of the farm was, uh, and still is, Melkbos Kail, and they bought a portion of the farm. And then they started the mine here at this specific site. But the copper and diamond mining booms, which brought people and economic stability to the region, have come and gone, leaving social pressures in their wake. These challenges are not easy to resolve in this delicate biodiversity hotspot, which has limited job creation potential. And whilst mining and fishing continues to contribute to employment in the region, the focus has to shift elsewhere. Government has identified tourism as a critical job creator for community upliftment, particularly in the area's rich history and cultural heritage. SCEPIS is a partnership between Conservation South Africa, the Development Bank of Southern Africa and the Critical Ecosystem Partnership Fund. This grant-based fund focuses on supporting people to become stewards of and to benefit from the conservation and sustainable use of their natural resources. There's a specific focus on women and youth, NGOs and community organizations. Namakwaland was part of the whole succulent garo ecosystem profile that was done by different partners back in the, in the early 2000s. SCAPIS has a portfolio of between projects and small businesses. Currently we're focusing, we have a focused set of projects and businesses of approximately 11. There's a whole range of them in fact. And we still build the capacity of the projects but we also make sure that because local government and government in general play such an important role that we do encourage a project to get institutional support after the lifespan of a project. One of the big attractions of Namakwaland occurs every spring 
when the dormant, arid winter landscape wakes up with a flamboyant display of beautiful wild flowers, attracting visitors from far and wide. Whilst the concentration of the trademark orange Namaquiland daisies is in the Skilpat Wildflower Reserve of the larger Namaqua National Park, this floral spectacle stretches from Nivoteville in the south to Alexander Bay in the north. The little-known villages of Kamis Kruen, Lierlifontein and Norafir try to outdo themselves with a variety of colour of wildflowers they have on offer, while Subatsfontein and Sarisam have vivid patches of yellow daisies in the west. Even the roadsides participate in the annual explosion of colour as tourists record the moment for posterity. It's important to keep in mind that flower gazing is rather like game viewing. Sightings are influenced by weather conditions and what was there yesterday is not always going to be there tomorrow. To find out more about how this and other Cape Floral Kingdoms, we are joined by Professor John Donaldson, Chief Director of Biodiversity Research at Sanby. John, thank you so much for making the time to join us. Can you start by describing what we see in Namakuland during the flower season? Most people will visit Namakuland in spring and what they'll be immediately uh, see is vast fields of, of daisies. The, the daisies mainly white, yellow and orange, go absolutely crazy at that time of year and form these thick carpets of, of uh, uh, plants that will cover the landscape as far as, as the eye can see. But in addition to that, what you also find in the Maquiland is that the, it's got some really special plants, particularly bulbs. Those are the plants that stay underground for most of the year and only come up in, in autumn and spring. And then the succulent plants, those that have got thick fleshy leaves that uh, survive the, the dry periods by holding onto their water. And those are particularly uh, prolific in, in the Maquiland. So you're going to see these amazing uh, carpets of yellow flowers and, and, and orange flowers and then these real special succulents and bulbs. And we also know that the Nama arid flora region is quite unique. What role does this play in the biodiversity of the area? Well the, the dry part of the western part of South Africa is kind of divided into three regions of flowers. So you've got the Namib, the Namib Desert in, in the north, mainly in Namibia, um, and then the, the Namib Karoo, which is that dry central part of South Africa. But the really special part from a botanical point of view is what we call the succulent Karoo, and that's in the, the dry part but in the winter rainfall. And uh, that's where you get this absolute explosion of, of plants, particularly the succulents and the bulbs. And globally, Scientists have recognized 35 places which are regarded as kind of unique for conserving plant diversity. And the succulent crew in the Maquiland is one of those places. And just because they have this incredible diversity of plants, so there's nowhere else in the world that you can go to to see this diversity of, say, the succulents, things like the little uh, lithops, the little stone plants, uh, or the pachypodium, the half mans. So those are plants you're not going to see anywhere else in the world. And also bulbs. So there are about 600 different types of bulbs in the Maquiland. And if you look at places like West Australia or California, that also have bulbs, they don't come anywhere close to that number. Of course, and in general, the overall Cape Floral Kingdoms are equally as unique and important for biodiversity. Can you elaborate why this is the case? Cape Flora is uh, unique globally. It, it's actually been recognized by, or it was recognized by scientists as a, a, a separate botanical kingdom or floral kingdom. So if you compare that, the little thin strip that goes around the sort of southwest part of South Africa as a kingdom compared to the whole of Europe and North America as one group or the whole of the rest of Africa. So that just gives you a sense of how um, special it is. And, and, and largely that's because Again, in, in the whole Cape, you've had a combination of soils, of mountains, of climate, of fire, just giving rise to this unbelievable explosion of, of plants that are quite different to what you'd find anywhere else on Earth. So, so that's what makes it so unique and why it's regarded as both a, a kingdom and also we have two bi of those biodiversity hotspots I mentioned earlier. You've got Namaquiland as one and then the Feinbos is another. So two out of the 35 that are recognized globally are both in the, the bigger Cape Floral region. How does this position the area then as a global tourism attraction in particular? It's, it's such an amazing spectacle. You know, I always think that you can go and lie on a beach in a whole bunch of different places in the world. They all have warm water, 
white sands and palm trees. But there are only a few places in the world that you can go and see some unique natural spectacles. And Namaqualand is one of them. So if you think of places like going to the Amazon, going to Madagascar, going to Patagonia, you know, for those who are conscious of what's actually there, Namaqualand is, is like that. It's a, it's a place that's unique where you're going to get an experience that you're not going to get uh, anywhere else. I think the challenge is that obviously people aren't only going for the experience of, of what they can see. Um, they also want to be looked after nicely. They want to have good food and a, and a warm place to sleep. So you have to combine the, the natural features with uh, all the other tourism infrastructure that needs to support it. When we take these uh, other factors that you've mentioned, John, into consideration, how big is the market for floral lovers or floral tourism? And how would you market this unique display? In 2008, there was a study that was undertaken of uh, various aspects of uh, the kind of natural economy in, in the Macquiland. And they said that uh, what came out of that study is that tourism is quite a, a complex issue. They separated flower tourism from uh, scenic tourism, and they reckoned that flower tourism alone was worth about 18 million rand a year, and then scenic tourism about 156 million rand a year. But the key thing that came out of that study is that tourism isn't just important by itself, but it's an important component of diversifying the economy. You know, it's, it's a dry area, it's quite a tough place to make a living, and so it's a way of diversifying what people are doing and keeping people out of poverty. So even if tourism alone isn't what they do, it's, it's a component of the economy that's really, really important.